So, hello everyone, and uh, I'd like to introduce uh, the second session on software measurement and uh, coding practices today. So in this session, uh, we are having uh, three uh, short presentations. So there are three emerging results and vision papers. And uh, I would like to give the stage uh, soon to the first presenter, that is uh, Jan Bertram, presenting a paper on trustworthiness perception in code review. Hello, I'm Ian Bertram. Uh, I'm an undergraduate at the University of Michigan, and this is Trustworthiness Perceptions in Code Review, an eye tracking study. Um, so our goal here is to examine trust and software engineering outcomes, specifically trust in a particular segment of code. There are several notable advantages of code reuse, but code reuse is most efficient when developers trust the code in question. Um, in particular, if developers trust the code, they will spend less time evaluating the code Furthermore, the code will be more likely to be reused and thus maintenance costs will be reduced. Now, why do we care about measuring developers' trust in a piece of code? Let's take a quick break to talk about automated program repair or APR. One thing that we hope to gain from APR is efficiency. In industry, CPU time is worth plenty, but developer time is worth more. APR would allow a team to trade some CPU time for more developer time. APR tools are already used in, in industry. Facebook, for instance, has deployed APR tools for their own code base. Now, assuming an APR tool that works well and generally makes trustworthy patches, what might happen if developers don't trust their APR tools? Well, we would expect the efficiency gains from APR to be at least partially negated. Now, to make all of this more testable, we reframe the problem around bias and ask, does the apparent provenance of a patch, meaning is it labeled human versus is it labeled an APR tool or machine generated, impact developers' opinions? And then since we are also curious about any effects on efficiency, we also ask, what about other desirable behaviors? In general, we prefer to lessen the cognitive load on developers since all else equal, we expect tasks that induce more cognitive load to be more time consuming. Now, why use eye tracking to study all of this? Well, previous work suggests that trust impacts various eye tracking metrics, particularly the intensity and distribution of visual attention. Furthermore, eye tracking is non-invasive because eye tracking equipment does not need to even come in contact with the participant. The eye tracking system also provides a large amount of objective data, which gives us higher confidence that we have measured the participant correctly than if we focused only on self-reports. When measuring eye movements, one of the two major features we focus on is fixations. These are periods during which the eye remains focused on a subject, such as a particular word or character in a line of text. Previous work in psychology has shown that during these periods, cognitive effort is spent understanding the subject. Accordingly, longer fixations generally indicate higher cognitive effort. As a result, this is a feature of interest when we are interested in measuring cognitive load. We often measure fixations by their duration. The other, measure, uh, the other major feature is saccades. Saccades are the periods between fixations when the eye is quickly traveling from one point to the next. When saccades are longer and fixations are farther apart, this may indicate a search pattern. As the search narrows, we expect saccades to become shorter. We often measure saccades by their duration as well, though we, though we may also measure their length in pixels or millimeters. Now, regarding our study, we recruited 10 participants and offered each of them six tasks uh, pertaining to the software system JFreeChart. Uh, JFreeChart has nearly 300,000 lines of code, um, and we gave the participants access to the code through the Eclipse IDE, in which they were able to test uh, the project and debug those unit tests. In general, our participants also had access to the whole code, uh, classes and unit tests through the IDE, they also had access to the bug report, which shows the patch and the labeled author of the patch. To control for the actual quality of the patches, we randomized which author the participants saw and whether it was labeled machine generated um, or human generated. Each task consists of reading the bug report and deciding to accept or reject the patch. Uh, the participants also had the opportunity to, to run the, the unit test suite. In order to measure participants' accuracy, we recorded the number of correct answers they gave, meaning whether they correctly rejected uh, a patch that had a bug in it, 
Uh, we also recorded the time that they took to complete a task, uh, as well as several measures of attention distribution and intensity um, to measure participants' effort. So far, what we've seen is that participants have favored patches that were labeled as machine generated for critical tasks, but have favored patches that were labeled human generated for coding style and readability. Patches labeled as machine generated have won out for overall quality. Now, how did machine generated patches win our participants' favor without scoring well in readability and style? Well, our population consisted entirely of students who may be more accustomed to smaller teams and smaller projects where the code's readability may not be critical to its success. For patches labeled machine generated, participants' fixation times were generally highest when looking at unit tests. For those labeled human generated, fixation times were highest when looking at actual patch code itself. Because participants rated machine generated code as being less readable, they may have been drawn to read the tests, which in our study were all human generated. Now, developers gave machine generated code mostly favorable treatment, but were less enthusiastic about its readability. While we have yet to observe the effects of provenance on performance, we did notice an effect on developers' attention distribution. If we saw the same results with more participants, this would be very interesting. In particular, it could mean that developers generally prefer to evaluate code generated by APR tools by examining the human-generated test cases instead, and doing so without sacrificing much in terms of efficiency. Any questions? So, uh, thanks a lot for your presentation. Uh, first of all, I would like to understand, I mean, which tools are available on the market nowadays for analyzing or for automatic program repair? Uh, Facebook does have a tool uh, that, that they use. Unfortunately, I'm not sure of its name. Um, this could yeah, be some quick Googling. Yeah, I found something for Facebook, but I didn't find any. I mean, I was like Googling during the presentation, but I didn't find uh, available, any tool available. I mean, it's just, they just mentioned about it. Um, uh, there is some previous experimental work as well, um, such as the, the Genprog tool uh, is something in this family. Mm -hmm. But which tool did you use then for uh, providing like automatic repairing results? So which um, tool have you used in your study? So we used a mix of human-generated and machine-generated patches um, mm -hmm. and then randomized which, uh, the off or, or which uh, of those that the participant actually saw. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure at this time which like, machine-generated tools the machine-generated patches were actually from. Um, okay. I can go back and look that up later. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No, no problem for, from this side. Okay, I guess there is no other question from the from the audience. Uh, uh, yes, just just a small question, uh, just the last one. So, which is the kind of implication from uh, for practitioners of your study? So, what would you recommend to practitioners to do? So, with a low number of participants, it's hard to make a recommendation at this time. <laughs> um, but as I did say at the end, if we found that the the same held true for more participants, um, what we could say is that we didn't really observe. Um, that machine-generated patches uh, cause the developers to perform worse when reading code, just that they prefer to read the test cases, uh, which are written generally by humans, at least in this study. Um, and so I, I suppose the recommendation would be um, to write test code very clearly and to write a lot of it. OK. OK. Yes. Thanks a lot. Thanks for your presentation. And uh, now I'd like to give the stage to the next presenter. Um, Mohamed Reza Hasir Pasand, that is presenting a paper on Java cryptography in uses in the wild. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so, so should I start? Okay, so this is Mohamed Reza Hasir Pasand. I'm a PhD student at the University of Bern, Switzerland, and I'm presenting Java cryptography uses in the wild. Developers commonly misuse crypto APIs uh, because of lack of expert knowledge in the field of cryptography. And you may ask what a crypto API misuse is. A crypto API misuse happens due to um, various reasons, for example, an, an, an insecure algorithm named key length padding mode or method call. For instance, here, message digest is a crypto 
crypto class in Java that produce hashes, and it accepts MD5 as its parameter. And uh, unfortunately, MD5 has been considered insecure for many years because of different reasons. It has a short lens, possible collisions might happen, or someone with the help of Hashgraph program can produce 25 billion hashes per second uh, with, a, uh, with just having a high-end graphical card at home. And unfortunately, MD5 is also advertised in Java official documentation. In this research, our contribution is divided into two parts. First, we made our analysis results available called CryptoMine, and we manually analyzed almost 50% of our analysis results. And then we contacted uh, developers of some of these uh, repositories and uh, we check their feedback. So in order to analyze Java projects, first we used uh, GitHub APIs in order to find Java projects and crypto uses in them. Then we, we use Maven build tool to compile those projects. Then we use a static analysis tool to analyze those projects. And in the end, we conducted a manual analysis and stored the data in a CSV file. To be precise, in CryptoMine, there are 489 projects, 15 Java Crypto APIs or JCA APIs were used, 487 projects have at least one crypto misuse, 1,280 records, or which is 48% of CryptoMine, are manually analyzed, and 40, uh, uh, 74 records, which is 6% of CryptoMine, are flagged as rejected in our manual analysis. So uh, the ones who are interested uh, can interactively work with crypto users at, at uh, crypto-explorer.com. The comparison between API misuse and API use depicts that more than half of the APIs uh, were misused. And the ones with many arguments are among the highly misused ones and the ones with fewer arguments are among the more, uh, more secure ones. So to shed some light on why crypto users are prevalent, we contacted some of uh, the repositories and we found eight themes in the responses of those developers. The first one is personal repository. The second one is will fix later, not maintain anymore, uncertainty, refer to other libraries, pull request, consult documentation, disagreement, and context. We, contact, we contacted 210 repositories and we received 140 responses from the repositories. So uh, this bar chart shows the number of received uh, responses in each theme. As it is evident, disagreement and context received the highest number of uh, responses. And uh, uncertainty is the second most seen uh, type of responses. And pull requests, consult documentation, not maintained anymore, almost received the same number of responses. Here, uh, we'll take a look at some of these themes. Uh, as it is uh, cleared, it seems that developers underestimate the impact of such misuse or crypto misuses on those who rely on online example. And developers are not really concerned about uh, security when a program is being used for personal use or on a small scale. For instance, a developer said that the project is created for internal use and no issue will be addressed. In the second theme, not maintained anymore, similar to personal repository theme, it can have, it can have negative consequ consequences on inexperienced developers who rely on open source projects regardless of how active the projects are. Pull request. Always there is a risk that developers who lack security knowledge may blindly accept security related pull requests that leads to downgrading security measures of a repository. For instance, the developer said that, I'm not sure if I understand the problem, I'm not a cryptologist, please pull request. Documentation. <clears throat> Developers have confidence in official documentation, but security concerns are mainly missed in such resources. For instance, the developer said, MD5 is still supported by Java according to the Java documentation. Uncertainty. Developer uncertainty is mainly related to the right method call or the secure algorithm name to pass to crypto APIs. 
An interesting question asked by a developer was that how these misuses can be exploited in real life. And in the end, disagreement and context. The use of crypto APIs to produce hashes was the most common non-security related usage. For instance, the developer said that SHA-1 was used only to generate a single hash for entire contents of a folder. Or another one said that MD5 was used to track the template source code, whether it has been changed or not. And one contributor also discussed that SHA-1 is still secure regardless of the recent collision vulnerability. The takeaway messages of this work are that developers still have difficulties in using crypto API securely. Not all misuses were at the same level of severity. Security hints in API documentation are limited, and we cannot solely blame developers for crypto users that are uh, found by static analysis tools. So thank you very much, and if there's any question. Thank you. Thanks a lot for your presentation. So you mentioned that not all the, the, the developers, uh, sorry, not all the, the severity were at the same level. Which kind of tool have you used and which kind of severity levels did you consider? Okay, uh, we use the static analysis tools called Cognicrypt. Yeah. But in our manual analysis, when we were looking at those, for example, misuses that the tool reported, we noticed that, for example, not all misuses can be exploited so easily in real life. So, for example, yeah. some of them can be exploited like as a man-in-the-middle attack, but some yeah. of them are memory attack that should be done in a local system. So the severity is kind of different and not all the alerts that people get from these static analysis tools are, are, are highly severe for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But do you, do you have an idea of the reasons why uh, they are not able to, to do that or to, to use those kind of security rules? Is it, it because, of, yeah, is it because of lack of skills or is it because of uh, complexity or for something else? Uh, there's a very, uh, long literature in this area. I think the first one is that developers do not embrace security tools in their development because of uh, organization policies. Sometimes it's because of lack of knowledge or they're not really familiar with the, with the tools and uh, some other, uh, I think, lack of knowledge and organizational policies and reluctant to use security tools. So we have, uh, it's more a consideration from the audience. So they say, he say, micro sulvna. Thank you, thank you very much for the nice presentation. I actually like the idea of contacting your developers. Correct me if I'm wrong. Most of the developers were aware of the right usage, but the context was not security related. Do you confirm that? Yes, that's true because uh, in the in the beginning we had a huge pile of misuses in our analysis. Yeah. So we could conclude that developers did not know that, but we actually contacted the developers and we realized that 45 responses uh, indicated that they knew actually how to use APIs correctly or securely. But the problem was that we did not consider the context because it was impossible actually to just looking at the line to consider the context. You have to study the whole project, I think. Sure, 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 sure. Uh, last question from uh, Peter Lupo. Do you personally so personally see reasons for understanding about cryptography. Do you think it might be a gap in undergrad courses? Um, uh, the undergrad courses. I think that maybe that's true because in some universities and some countries, undergrad students do not have any course with the name of cryptography and they don't learn cryptography, while cryptography is really an important factor of development nowadays. And I think that's a good point that, yeah, it can be one of the reasons, definitely. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks a lot for your presentation. That was really nice. And uh, I would like now to move to the last presentation of this session that is, uh, uh, on the use of C Sharp and safe code context uh, provided by Ahsan Sami. Thank you. Hello. Uh, do you see my screen? Yes. Yes. 
Okay, uh, so I full screen there. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman, uh, for the time you allowed me. I would like to talk about usage of C sharp unsafe code and the uh, Stack Overflow. Uh, I'm presenting Ehsan's work, and I'd like to thank Foots and Rias for their contributions and the work. Basically, C sharp uh, programming language is a is a managed language. It means it maintains a type safety and security, and it doesn't support. It doesn't uh, allow pointer arithmetic. But uh, it means that if we have a code, uh, the common language runtime mechanism makes sure the native code doesn't do any harm. But at the same time, uh, C Sharp provides unmanaged code context. In that context, like the sample that is provided here, it facilitates performance and it allows uh, pointer arithmetic. Use of keyword unsafe, as it is indicated here, tells the compiler to run in unsafe mode. This is a post that basically compared a couple of uh, mechanism and the unsafe was much faster. So the research questions we tried to answer was, how prevalent are C-sharp unsafe code context and stack overflow as a basic uh, question and answer website? And what are the scenarios that developers actually use stack or uh, use unsafe context? And the main question was, are those uh, code samples vulnerable? So uh, there are a large amount of work on Stack Overflow and also on the security of Stack Overflow. As you can see, there are works on API, Java, and also even me, myself, I uh, did a recent work on C++ vulnerability and its migration to JavaScript, uh, to GitHub. And for Java, for C, for C++, there are guidelines, there are standardization, there are even recommendations. But basically, we couldn't find any single study that works on the security of C-sharp codes. No study uh, focused on C-sharp security. Therefore, we couldn't find any work on C-sharp community question and answer uh, code snippets. So based on best of our knowledge, this is the first work on security of C-sharp codes. So um, the, way we try, the way we tried actually to uh, find uh, the data set was we used the uh, SO torrent, which is uh, 10 years data of Stack Overflow from 2008 to 2018. And we checked the post for unsafe tag. We came up with uh, almost 600 posts. Then um, these are the samples of those posts. We actually look through them, look through the post, look through the title, the tag, and everything. And we came up with these uh, extracted keywords. So these were, after the review, we found that these keywords were actually among the unsafe posts. So we then, we ran some uh, uh, we ran some regular expressions on the post uh, and on the keyword search for these keywords and also because in the stack uh, in SO torrent we can the codes are separated so we search in the codes for unsafe and the way it is used and we manually checked if they were actually unsafe. So we came up with over 1,600 posts. So in total, we had uh, nearly 2,300 unsafe posts. So the first question was how prevalent they are. So we came up with the percentage of unsafe codes uh, and the total number of C-sharp codes. So we came up with the percentage over the 10 years. And we noticed the percentage of C-sharp unsafe usage in comparison to C sharp, stays the same. That is, uh, in the past 10 years, uh, we didn't have any change in the way unsafe is used, and it is still a popular method, and programmers are using it. So, in the second question, that uh, what were the contexts that people are using it? We searched the tags, as I said, we categorized the tag, and we did manual review. We know these three main categories. We, found image processing, interoperability, like platform invocation, C++ interoperability, or common interoperability. 
And we found another axis was memory axis that used stack allocations and pointer manipulation and performance improvements. So uh, the third finding we found out was the image processing, uh, which covered uh, nearly one third of the post, were the most popular on safe code usage. And basically it is for, re uh, for performance reasons. We also observed that a stack alloc, which is an unsafe operator, and it is not recommended by Microsoft to use it in the unsafe context, uh, it is used pretty, it is pretty prevalent also. Um, it is recommended that we use it inside the safe context. So these are the categories of unsafe codes that are used in Stack Overflow among those 2,283 posts. And these are the findings, like uh, this is an image processing post. Uh, it is used basically for performance reason. We could use like GetPixel, it's a better uh, form, or um, this is actually C++ interoperability scenario that C++ DLL is imported into the uh, program in the unsafe code. The function is used. This is a stack alloc, as you can see, uh, the one I said, instead of, this is unsafe scenario for uh, memory access. And the third question was uh, if there was an, uh, any vulnerability in the code. We actually just searched, this is the analysis, we just focused on dangerous functions. And uh, we interestingly found 29 string copy usage, 14 mem copy usage, that create memory problem. We found 20, 12 uh, random, which is an obsolete functions, and two, which is an ASCII to integer. These are the samples and the uh, post IDs for mem copy and the other. So basically image processing, uh, as I told you, it was very popular, it was for performance reason. And uh, despite Microsoft design warning, uh, 165 uh, P invoke were used outside native method. Microsoft recommends that if we want to use P invoke and uh, process invocation, it is used inside the native method. So basically we had seven findings and uh, the takeaway would be, uh, although uh, unsafe is used for performance reasons, now there are a lot of contexts that it can be used in a regular context. So uh, thank you, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to hear your uh, questions. Thanks for your presentation. That was very interesting. So uh, one question about this, uh, uh, this analysis. Uh, what is your future plan? What is your roadmap? So I would expect uh, to see some uh, next results in the future, and especially some extra recommendation for uh, developers. Sure, sure. Uh, actually, um, um, maybe it's better to, for interested readers to see my C++ analysis and Stack Overflow that we looked mm -hmm. into migration of, C, uh, migration of security problems into the GitHub projects, and then we checked uh, what, if they were actually uh, became safe or became, uh, didn't fix. And also we asked developers why they didn't fix it. So that's a one method. I mean, we look forward to get more uh, deeper into this and see if we can find some actual projects that had unsafe problems. And the other direction that Esan is also working is trying to find other security problems within the C-sharp uh, code snippets. Okay, thank you. We do have a question from uh, uh, Michael Koblenz, do you have any insight about techniques to discourage inappropriate use of unsafe blocks? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, as I mentioned, uh, if you are using C Sharp and you want to use uh, unsafe methods, it is uh, very good to use it in the. Uh, as I uh, as I also mentioned it, it is better. Uh, can I can I share my screen? Uh, do you see my screen? So it is uh, actually uh, Microsoft recommends using native methods. So please do use native methods when you want to use uh, unmanaged code. Uh, Microsoft recommends three types, native methods, safe native method, and in those uh, they surpass the stack and the managed code 
actually checkers, so they, they, they do perform stack walk and they make sure no security problem occurs. And also stack alloc, uh, it is used for performance reason, but again, uh, stack alloc can be used in the safe context. So please do not use uh, stack alloc in non-safe. So uh, mainly if, uh, I mean, recently, Processors are very, uh, very powerful, and if you can write a more, I mean, more compact code, uh, basically we think you don't need to use unsafe. Just we found uh, uh, image processing applications proper for the usage. Thank you. Thanks a lot for the presentation. So I'd like to thank all the presenter of this session. And uh, now we can start or we can have the, like short break before the next session on energy consumption at 4.15 Central European time. Thank you and bye. <laughs>